This episode takes us to the front lines of the Syrian refugee emergency in Lebanon, a country that has received over one and a half million refugees since the war began. This unreported world film first aired in March 2017. Our reporter, Sean O'Connor, went to Lebanon and found that sick refugee children are suffering and even dying while they wait for better treatment. Limited resources mean tough choices about those who are helped and those who are left behind. I'm in Lebanon investigating what some Syrian refugees are telling me is a humanitarian scandal. They say it involves children who are desperately ill. Like 13-year-old Yusuf. He's got cancer that could be cured, but only with the right treatment. <laughs> and then there's Abdullah. He's 10 and has a chronic blood disorder. If he doesn't get regular blood transfusions, he'll die within months. I've heard that the UN body which provides healthcare for refugees won't fund treatment for kids like Yusuf and Abdullah. And the UN and some governments put them at the back of the queue for resettlement. I want to find out more. I'm in the Beka Valley, close to Lebanon's border with Syria. Some of the one and a half million Syrian refugees in Lebanon live here, in tents or short-term housing. We've heard about a young Syrian boy from Homs who was diagnosed with cancer about three years ago, so I've arranged to meet him. Let me take off my boots. Very nice to meet you. Anna Ismi Shona. Anna Yusuf. Yusuf. Yeah, sure. I'll have a little bit. <laughs> we didn't meet you yesterday. It's lovely to meet you. Yusuf has non Hodgkin lymphoma. <laughs> a cancer that, with the right treatment, has an 80% survival rate. What can you play, Yusuf? I love you. You love me. We are a Good. Bravo. Bravo, eh? Oh. Yusuf has needed chemotherapy. At home, before the war, the Syrian healthcare system would have covered the cost. But free healthcare within the Lebanese system isn't open to refugees. So as parents turn to the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, but officials there told them they won't fund it either. <laughs> Oh my God. It's difficult for refugees to get work permits. Yusuf's dad, Mahmoud, doesn't have one. So they had to scrape together the money for treatment from local charities. Aha. Did you lose your hair during treatment? Yusuf's cancer has already come back twice. And his mum, Sabia, says they can't afford a scan to see if the latest chemo has worked. If it hasn't, his only hope is a bone marrow transplant abroad. What would you like to happen now for Yusuf? Five of Yusuf's healthy cousins, along with their parents, have been resettled in the UK. I want to find out why a vulnerable child like Yusuf hasn't been resettled and why the UNHCR won't fund his chemotherapy. 
So I visit a Lebanese charity that's been helping him, called Karma. It's Shona and Channel 4. Nice Very nice to meet you. Yeah. I spot one familiar face. Yes. <laughs> this is Yusuf oh. in the hospital. Mariam Yunus says a big part of the charity's funding comes from Syrians living abroad. They help Yusuf and more than 40 other Syrian refugee children with cancer. She tells me 12 of the children face a life-threatening situation unless they're resettled urgently. We had a couple of cases where the child literally died because it couldn't be resettled in time. I mean, we are really, really overwhelmed. I mean, we very often don't know how to continue and it's always, the thing is it doesn't stop. Like every new case, we know this is a huge responsibility because we know there will be no other organizations they can go to. There's no one else who will help. And it's getting worse and worse. Why is it that UNHCR don't look after Syrian refugees who have cancer, and in particular children who have cancer? They say they don't have the financial means for, for covering the treatment. I think it's a very cruel logic that the treatment is very expensive. So of course, like you would like, pay a lot of money for one patient. Mariam says she knows just four children with cancer who've been resettled to Germany and Canada. Yusuf's parents told us that their extended family members had been resettled and, and that all of the children are healthy. Does that surprise you? I've heard many cases where exactly this happened, actually. So many of the parents tell me that other relatives of them have been resettled before them uh, with healthy children. We tried to find out how many Syrian children with medical needs have been resettled in the UK and elsewhere. UNHCR said they can't share this information. The UK government said it doesn't publish those statistics. Cancer is not the only illness for which UNHCR help is severely limited. In all, there are 30 conditions. I'm on my way to South Lebanon, just a few miles from the border with Israel, to meet another child affected by this. Woo! This is Abdullah. He's 10. His family fled Syria four years ago. They lost their home and also their free access to the medical care Abdullah desperately needs. No. His dad, Mohammed, tells me Abdullah's got a serious blood condition called thalassemia. My stepsister gives me. <laughs> and if Abdullah doesn't get these blood transfusions, what would happen? But Abdullah's mum, Basma, says the UNHCR told them thalassemia is too expensive for them to treat. Abdullah hasn't had a blood transfusion in a fortnight, and he's feeling weak. Family life goes on hold as they try to sort out the next one. What is this, Mohammed? Mohammed is relying on this piece of paper and essentially the generosity of these people on this list. It's as if he set up his own DIY healthcare system because another system just doesn't seem to exist. Hey, Abed. The donor, Abdul Munaym, arrives. He's another Syrian refugee. They head off to the blood collection center. But there's a problem. 
عنده القوي ضمه مش كافي لا يقدر يتبرع على عبد الله فبدنا نجيب متبرع ثاني وهلا صعب انه ما راح اجيب واحد ثاني The Red Cross services here have limited resources but they do offer to search their database في حضرتك كنت متبرع عنا بي بي بوزيتيف To make things even harder only about one in seven people has the blood group Abdullah needs It takes 10 calls before there's a result. Are you a tickle off? Okay. We have one? Uh, yeah, we have a donor. Ooh. The new donor arrives within minutes and his blood is good. How do you feel? <laughs> With the blood in the bank, Abdullah can have his transfusion tomorrow. These makeshift arrangements are putting Abdullah in real danger. His family say the UNHCR have told them they've been accepted for resettlement by the USA because of his medical needs. But that was six months ago and they've had no more news. بحب اني اعيش بامريكا لان في لان في بنيات كبار وبحر وثلج وفي ملاعب اتدرب فيهم Early morning in downtown Beirut Yusuf and his parents have been traveling from home since 5 a.m. A Syrian charity has offered to pay for a scan for Yusuf. Finally, the family have the chance to find out whether his chemo has worked. Are you nervous? Truly. What do you know about the test happening today? <laughs> The scan takes 15 minutes. But Yusuf won't get his results until the next day. How are you, buddy? If the scan shows his cancer has returned, Yusuf will need a bone marrow transplant that can only happen abroad. His mum, Sabia, says she wanted to go to the UK, which has promised to resettle 20,000 vulnerable Syrian refugees. But, she alleges, UNHCR officials said Yusuf's illness was a problem. The UNHCR told you that the UK couldn't accept children like Yusuf. Did they tell you why? We put this to the UNHCR, who denied that resettlement officers would say this. Sabia says the UNHCR officials asked if she had other family who needed resettling. She says as a result, five of Yusuf's healthy cousins and their parents have gone to the UK while he's remained behind. We've verified this is the case. Yusuf, meanwhile, is still waiting for news about whether France will accept him. ونحن من العيال المنسيه ما بعرف شو ما بعرف ليش هيك The UK government told us that UNHCR chooses who is referred to the UK for resettlement that the UK's never turned down a case based on their medical needs and that any suggestion they're refusing to take refugees with complex medical needs is unfounded In South Lebanon 
Abdullah and his dad have travelled for more than two hours for him to receive his blood transfusion. Marhaba. The room is full of sick Syrian refugee children. As in Abdullah's case, their parents have had to find blood. In this clinic, a Syrian charity called Erda provides the transfusions that would have been free back home. The nurses tell me they help more than 20 children each week and have had to turn away another 50 families because they don't have space. After five hours at the clinic, Abdullah's transfusion is done. Do you feel a bit different now that you have all that blood? Even though Abdullah is done and dusted for today, it'll only be another week and a half before he has to go through this whole process again. So I'm just not really sure how he can go on like this and live a normal life. For the family, resettlement can't come too soon. They say they've heard nothing since the UNHCR told them in August 2016 that the USA had approved them for resettlement. Mohammed's worried something's gone wrong, so he makes one of his regular calls to the UNHCR looking for news. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. He's wondering if President Trump's executive order banning Syrians traveling to the US is affecting Abdullah, but no one can tell him. Mohammed says the UNHCR has confirmed they'll resettle his brother and his seven healthy children in Norway this spring. It seems that, like Yusuf, Abdullah is being left behind while his healthy relatives are resettled. We've arranged to meet Yusuf and his dad, who travelled to Beirut today to find out the results of the scan. But first, they've got bad news to tell me from France. The French government hasn't given reasons. No country ever does. The French government refugee agency told us they had resettled 5,000 Syrians, including many sick children and their families. Marhaba. Yusuf's come to hear his results from Dr. Peter Noon, a Lebanese child cancer specialist who helps Syrian refugee children for free. With resettlement off the table, Yusuf has no chance of a bone marrow transplant. If his cancer is returned, it's a death sentence. So, we see the PET scan findings on the neck, we Yusuf. Everything is okay. For now, 
the relief is profound. But Yusuf will need close monitoring for years in case the cancer returns. We've seen the influence the UNHCR has over the fate of sick children. Western governments charge them with some very difficult choices. The UNHCR says in 2016 they had just over half the funding they needed for the Syrian refugee crisis and only half the number of resettlement places needed. Many might think that the sickest children would be prioritised, but from what I've seen, that isn't the case. Hi, David. Hi. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. How are you? I want to know how the UNHCR makes their decisions. Dana Sleiman is a spokesperson for the UNHCR in Lebanon. If the prognosis is, is, uh, is very negative, unfortunately, it, it is heartbreaking, yes, but unfortunately we cannot, uh, we cannot proceed with resettlement because the outcome will not be improved conditions compared with conditions here in Lebanon. I mean, just uttering the words makes me feel really bad, but this is the difficulty of the job at the end of the day. Do you think the system of resettlement is working? Unfortunately, the needs here in Lebanon outstretch the resettlement quota that's available to us in resettlement countries. So if we have people who have equally dire needs, we have to make sure that, unfortunately, that people who have better chances at prospering are resettled. I ask why, if the sickest children are unlikely to be resettled, the UNHCR won't help with their treatment. The sad reality is that we have to do this, this prioritization uh, uh, schemes to optimize the way we spend our, our very limited funding. We prioritize, for example, the provision of uh, medical equipment and medication in primary healthcare centers because with the, with the same amount of money, we're able to help, for example, 10,000 refugees versus helping one refugee. And we're doing our very best against very overwhelming odds. Before I leave Lebanon, I meet Ahmed Salame. I found that a system designed to help the most Syrian refugees possible denies some of the sickest children medical treatment and the chance of resettlement. We can't find anyone keeping a record of how many of these children die, but one was Ahmed's son. Seven-year-old Mohammed had a heart defect. Everyone agreed he needed medical help but it never came. Limited resources mean hard decisions and tough consequences. Without more international funding for medical help here in Lebanon or more resettlement spaces elsewhere, very sick children will continue to suffer and die.